I get quite a few letters, some of which make me really happy, and some of which don't make me as happy. So I got a letter recently from a young person that worships here in our community. It said this, Dear Pastor Randy, my name is Emma Lichty. You may know my family. We've been going to your church for as long as I can remember. I go to Redlands Adventist Academy. I enjoy playing basketball and playing with my friend Maddie. Mr. Brown, Ms. Cosgrove, and Ms. Miller are my teachers. P.S. If you put me in the sermon, my friend will give me five dollars. <laughs> my friend is Andrew from Pastor Doug's ministry, Emma Lichty. Well, Andrew, you better pay up. Because if you don't, Emma's going to bring you to church. <laughs> so we all have things we desire, right? Might be a shout out, might be $5, or it might be something much more important. So I have a question for you. Suppose God were to give you the opportunity to ask for anything you want, not necessarily in the global terms, but in personal terms. For what would you ask? I give you anything you want. I'm giving you the privilege, the opportunity to ask for what you desire. What do you desire? For what would you ask? Would you ask for wealth? For fame? For wisdom, intelligence, beauty? What would you ask for? So there's a place in Scripture where somebody is given that opportunity. His name is Solomon, 1 Kings chapter 3. Shortly after he became king, while he's worshiping and honoring God that night, a dream comes to him, and in the dream, God says, Solomon, I'll give you what you ask for. What do you desire? You remember what he asked for, right? He said, God, I want wisdom. And God says, because you had the wisdom to ask for wisdom, you're going to get everything else thrown in. So what would you desire? What would be your request? So today we're going to look at Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 30, the next to last chapter in Proverbs. We're going to see that this chapter was written by someone named Agur. A-G-U-R. It's a name that only appears here in Scripture. We know about Agur, whatever we read right here. But he has a similar kind of request. It's this kind of request where he's having this opportunity to ask God for anything. And it's going to be very interesting to see what his request is. Now, it may interest you to know that in the Hebrew Mishnah, the Mishnah is an ancient Hebrew commentary on Scripture. The Mishnah on Proverbs says Agur was a pen name. Wasn't the writer's real name. The writer's real name was... Solomon. Well, we can't know that with certainty, but it's a very old commentary. So whether Solomon or Agur, we come to this place where he has the opportunity to ask, God, here is what I want. Here is what I desire. So what does he say? So we're going to read the passage first, only three verses long. And then we're going to kind of back into kind of unpack what it has to say. So Proverbs chapter 30, beginning in verse 7, says this. Two things I ask of you, Lord. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I have made too, may have too much and disown you and say, Who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. It's a deep request, a sincere, heartfelt request. Lord, I'm going to ask two things of you. In fact, these are so important to me. Please give these to me before I die. Deep request. Instead of one, he has two. So let's take them one at a time. So back again, we'll read just the introduction and his first request. Two things I ask of you, Lord. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood 
and lies far from me. That's an interesting request. Is that where you would start? Keep falsehood and lies far from me. I, I thought maybe what we could call this request is just the facts. Just the facts. In fact, if we stated this in a positive way, keep falsehood and lies far from me, stated in a positive way, keep me truthful. Now, Proverbs has much to say about falsehood, lies, and truth. In fact, if you read through the book, you'll find that proverb after proverb after proverb after proverb has to do with truth and with falsehood. And that in Proverbs, truth has to do with the character of God. Truth is the truth about who God is, about his character, his heart, how he functions in the world. So that what Agur may be saying is, God, let me live a life that is an accurate reflection of the reality of who you are. Keep lies and falsehood away from me. Help me to live truthful to your character and person. Now, when we talk about truth and falsehood and lies, it's a bit, it's a bit distressing. Because I did some checking this week. I thought I remembered this right, and unfortunately I did. Survey after study over time has shown that we Americans... Us, we Americans, lie even daily. And sometimes more than once or twice a day. Now, admittedly, sometimes it's just little things, little white lies. Shaded a little bit here, adjusted a little bit there, tweak it a little bit over here. Not major things, but they're not actually truthful. Honey, what did you think of my sermon? Oh, that's the best sermon I ever heard. Hmm. How do I look in this suit? How do I look in this dress? Oh, baby, you look, you, you're amazing. Hopefully that's the truth. I read this week, Chuck Swindoll wrote the story about the mother and the little boy that got on a train back in the days when many people rode the train, and when once a child turned from five years old to six years old, they had to pay Getting on the train, the mother says to the little boy, tell him you're five, tell him. But mommy, I'm just, shh, tell him you're five. So they're on the train, traveling along. Along comes the porter, clicking the tickets, comes the little boy. How are you today, little boy? How old are you? Uh, I'm five. Oh, great. You don't have to pay. Went on down the road. A little bit later, he came back up the road again, saw the little boy, tousled his hair. You having a good day, son? Yes, sir. You enjoying the ride? Yes, sir. So, so tell me, when do you turn six? Well, I turn six right about the time I get off this train. <laughs> Just a little lie. Or what about the sports writer Peter King? Peter King wrote a story about uh, Joe Montana, the Super Bowl winning MVP quarterback, legendary of the San Francisco 49ers. And it was a time when Steve Young, soon to become a Super Bowl winning MVP quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers, was also on the team. The media was talking to them a lot, had picked up a lot on the tension that existed between the two of them. So Coach Walsh did something that year that wasn't popular with the players. He said, we're going to practice on Christmas Day. Well, come on. But he said, I'll tell you what we'll do. We're going to eat meals as families. And so all of you players, those of you who are married, you have all the single players over to your house. So that's what they did. Thus, Joe Montana, married, had at his table Steve Young, single, for Christmas dinner. And Peter King got invited. He said, I was sitting there in the conversation. It was going okay so far. Conversation was flowing. And then Joe's little girl, Dad, 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 you, you know the drill. Fine. Oh, yeah, yes, yes, what, what, what do you want? She looks at Steve Young and she says to her dad, is this the guy we hate? 
I'm sure Montana nearly swallowed his tongue. He said, oh, no, 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 that's someone else. That's someone else. I mean, what are you going to say? It's just a little lie. And Agur says, keep falsehood and lies far from me. A negative way of saying, make me truthful. Or in the context of the theology of Proverbs, let my life reflect the truth of your character. I don't think, maybe Agur, Agur thought about this, I'm not sure he was thinking about trains and Super Bowl quarterbacks and little white lies. Maybe, maybe it's included. What I do think is included is whether our lives are truthful. Do we live in a way that manifests what I think is at the core of this request, and that is integrity? We all fail. We all fall short. But is that the direction in which God is growing us? I ran across again this week, had read it before, had forgotten about it. I ran across the seven blunders of the world. Have you read them lately? They are attributed to Mahatma Gandhi, the great Indian political and spiritual leader. So Gandhi apparently authored these, I don't know that he named them that, but they became known as the seven blunders of the world. He was saying, this is a problem in our world. Now, here's the challenge for us as people of faith. When we look at these seven blunders, more than likely we will say to each one, yeah, absolutely, no, 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 that's wrong, that's wrong. That. We, we, we'll say that, but the question is not what we say, but how we live. So what are the seven blunders? blunders of the world. Here they are. Wealth without work, pleasure without conscience, knowledge without character, commerce without morality, science without humanity, worship without sacrifice, politics without principle. Unless I miss my guess, Many here would have checked yes to each one of those. But that's not where we test it. Where we test it is in how we live our lives. And Agur says, let me live a truthful life that reflects integrity with your character. Wow. That's heavy. Anything you want to ask God, what would it be? That's where Agur begins. But he has a second request. If the first request we call just the facts, trying to get at the truth, the second request I think we would call just enough. Just enough. So back to Proverbs 30. Two things I ask of you, Lord. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Here comes the second one. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Now, honesty time. Is that at the top of your list of requests to God? It wasn't at the top of mine. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Wow. But, and this is how the New Living Translation renders the last line in that verse. It says, but give me just enough to satisfy my needs. Give me just enough. Wow. So Marshall Shelley, at the time he wrote this, was editor at Leadership Journal. He wrote this about an experience he had with his father-in-law. Listen to his words. My wife's father is a Kansas farmer. He spent a lifetime raising wheat, corn, milo, beef, and along the way some sheep and chickens. One morning while I followed him around the farm, we talked about the differences between city living and a rural lifestyle. My father-in-law said, Most city folks I know expect each year to be better than the last. They think it's normal to get an annual raise to earn more this year than you did last year. But as a farmer, I have good years and bad years. It all depends on rain at the right time, dry days for harvest, no damaging storms. Some years we have more, some years we have less. And then 
Shelley reflected on that by saying, it was one of those indelible moments of stunning clarity. That law of the harvest, some years being fat, others being lean, applies to much more than agriculture. Growing in spiritual maturity requires gratefully accepting the seasons of more and the seasons of less that God weaves into specific areas of our lives, our friendships, marriage, career, finances, ministry, and spiritual growth. Just enough, Lord. Just enough. Some say that when an itinerant Nazarene rabbi was asked a question that he drew on this proverb. Lord, teach us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Just enough. Keep us dependent on you. But again, was that at the top of your list of requests? Wasn't for me. In fact, my question was, why? Why would you ask that? I don't understand. I know it's a golden mean. I get that. But why would you ask that? Well, he answers. We go back to Proverbs 30. This time we will look at the last verse of the little section. When he's just finished saying, keep, me, keep lies and falsehood away from me, give me truth and integrity, don't let me be rich or poor, keep me dependent on you, give me just enough. When he finishes that, then he says this, verse 9, otherwise, in light of all that, otherwise I may have too much and disown you and say, who's the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. So once again, it has to do with God. It has to do with what this means for my relationship with God. But there's something else contained within his words, Agur's words. It seems that Agur is saying there is a temptation that is unique to the rich. And there's a temptation that is unique to the poor. I'm not sure I'm strong enough to resist either temptation. So keep me here by giving me just enough. So what are you talking about? What, what, what are these temptations that are unique to the rich and unique to the poor? We'll start over here where he does. He says, the temptation unique to the rich is to become self-sufficient and say, what did God have to do with it? Who? God? What does he have to do with this? Now, I want to say for the benefit of our community here, that I've had the joyful privilege of interacting with and knowing many who have much by way of this world's goods. And I have seen in this community one after another, after another, after another, who have been unbelievably generous in supporting not just this church, but students in need, people in need, the world, mission, outreach. And I just say, I thank God for you. I thank God, thank God that he has given you that gift to earn and to make something far in excess of what many of us could ever make and that you have handled it in that manner. But that doesn't deny the reality of the temptation. The temptation, says Agur, is the temptation to say, I did this. This is me. It's my hard study. It's my genius at business. It's my investments. It's my, and the list just keeps longer. And pretty soon, we start to hear echoes of that Old Testament figure who could stand on the roof of the palace and could look at the splendid city-state before him and say, is not this great Babylon that I have built? God? What do you have to do with it? Don't need any talk about God. I did this. And Agur says, it's the ones who have it all who face that temptation. The late Billy Graham 
These are his words. Reflecting on an incident that pertains to this theme, Graham wrote, some years ago, Ruth and I, his, island, his, his wife, Ruth and I were on an island in the Caribbean. One of the wealthiest men in the world had asked us to come to his lavish home for lunch. He was 75 years old, and throughout the entire meal, he seemed close to tears. I'm the most miserable man in the world, he said. Out there is my yacht. I can go anywhere I want to. I have my private plane, my helicopters. I have everything I want to make my life happy, yet I am as miserable as hell. We talked to him and prayed with him, trying to point him to Christ, who alone gives lasting meaning to life. Then we went down the hill to a small cottage where we were staying. That afternoon, the pastor of the local Baptist church came to call. He was an Englishman, and he too was a widower who spent most of his time taking care of his two invalid sisters. He was full of enthusiasm and love for Christ and others. I don't have two pounds to my name, he said with a smile, yet I am the happiest man on this island. Summarized, your happiness in life can never be secured or lost by the balance in your bank account. And it's as though Agur is saying, I'm not sure I could always remember that, God. I might fail with that. So give me just enough. The late Fred Craddock, premier preacher, standing right here where I stand today, said to our congregation, it must be, he said, speaking about his theme for the day, it must be an awful thing to struggle under the cloud, the dark cloud of prosperity. And I remember thinking, what are you talking about? Well, maybe he had read Agur. Don't know that I can handle that, God. Give me just enough. But then he says, there's a temptation unique to the poor. They are especially vulnerable to this temptation. And that is the temptation since you don't have anything, since you're not sure where the rent is coming from, since you're not sure where your next meal is coming from, the temptation is very strong to do whatever it takes, illicit or not, to survive. And Agur says, I'm not sure I'm strong enough to deal with that temptation. So give me just enough. This week I read the story of a semi-pro football player, had great desires to be in the NFL, never made it, ended up semi-pro. Finally had to leave because of damage to his body, probably helped along the way by performance-enhancing drugs. When asked about it by the reporter, he said, I was prepared to do anything I had, anything I had to do to achieve that. That's the temptation right there. So it behooves those of us who know where the rent is coming from and who don't have to worry about tonight's meal to be charitable to those who have those concerns. Could it be that that young father who's dealing drugs is trying to pay the rent? Could it be that that woman who sells her body is trying to feed her body? Could it be that man who cooks the books is trying to take care of all the people dependent on this company? That they have just succumbed to that temptation that says, when I don't know how I'm going to survive, I'm willing to do anything to provide for my needs. So Agur says, God, I don't know that I'm strong enough for that. So give me just enough. I wondered how that part of his passage would relate to those of us here. Because many of us know where the rent's coming from and the next meal is coming from. But I would hasten to add that the percentage, I've been learning this in the last year or two, the percentage of students at Loma Linda University who are food insecure 
is stunning. Our church has stepped into that. We'd love to have you be a part of it. But the truth is, most of us don't have those worries. So does Agur's passage then not have anything to do with us? Or could it be that every one of us has areas in our lives where we don't have enough and that in those areas where we don't have enough, where we're poor in that area, our temptation will be, do whatever I need to do to meet the need I have to deal with that issue. I just, I'm, I'm just not smart enough as everyone else in this class. They study, they get it. I'm struggling. I just don't have enough brain power. And then the temptation to cheat becomes intense. I just don't have enough to fit in with this community to, to, to meet and match things that the neighbors have with our... So then the temptation to go into profound debt to keep up. It's very real. I just don't have enough. Will you fill in the blanks? And it will be in that area that Agur's temptation will be real for you. And it's compounded by this little thing we, we, we have in our world today called social media. Because when we spend time and hours on, end, on Facebook and on Instagram and on TikTok and we see the photo curated lives that are all the way across the entire social media world and we looked at the, look at these airbrushed perfect families and pictures and homes and we say, I don't have enough. What am I going to do? Because I'm just so, so ordinary. And it's that word that a writer from the New York Times and GQ, Joe Queenan, steps in and says, I have something to say about that. Queenan says very critically that our culture has something he calls the inability to accept the ordinary. This is a secular writer. We have an inability as a culture, he says, to accept the ordinary. He says, we insist that every experience be a watershed, every meal extraordinary, every friendship epochal, every concert superb, every sunset meta-celestial. Nothing can ever be again exactly what it was in the first place, ordinary. Ordinary. Agur's temptation. Michael Horton, a Christian writer, picked up on what Queen and said and said this, Today we feel the pressure to have our weddings look like the cover of a bridal magazine or movie set. Our marriages have to be made in heaven even though we're very much on earth. Our presentations at work have to dazzle. Our kids have to make the dean's list and get into the best graduate schools. Nothing short of brilliant and groundbreaking will satisfy if you want to do a good job. When we do stop and smell the roses... It has to be an unforgettable package at an amazing resort. It's not enough, writes Horton. It's not enough to enjoy simple recreation at a public park because extreme sports are what make the headlines. Ordinary. We all have that place where we feel poor. If the unique temptation of the rich is to say, who's God? What God have to do with this? Then Agur says, the unique temptation of the poor is to say, I have to provide for this, even if it's illicit. So Agur prays, God, give me just enough. Not sure I can overcome these temptations. So what about it? If you have the opportunity to ask for whatever you want, do those two things make the list? Before this week, I'm not sure they'd have made my top list of 50. I don't know. But Agur has had me thinking deeply. In fact, I think what he's saying, first of all, is God... Give me integrity. 
just the facts. Give me integrity. And God, give me dependence just enough. Give me integrity and give me dependence on you. That's what I ask for, Lord. But I even wondered about that. I thought, I think there's something deeper to what Agur is asking. Because as true as these are to the passage, as essential as these are in our lives, I think maybe down underneath what Agur is asking is, God, give me contentment. Make me content. Because a person who's content has no need to lie, has no need to fabricate, has no need to live life in a way that differs from the character of God. They're content. And a person who's content doesn't have to claim it's, I did all this, and doesn't have to say, I have to have this right now or I can't survive. They're content. In fact, the Apostle Paul, in the New Testament, after describing situations just as diverse as what Agur describes in this passage. Do you know what he says? He says, I have learned in whatever condition I find myself therewith to be content. So maybe that's what he seeks. Maybe what Agur prays for is just enough to be content. So I started with a letter from somebody in this congregation. I want to end with an email from somebody in this congregation. This email was sent to me by Milford Harrison. It doesn't have a name as the author of the story. Maybe the story is apocryphal. But I want you to hear what the writer wrote. The writer said, Recently I overheard an older father and his adult daughter in their last moments together at the airport. The departure time was close. Standing near the security gate, they hugged, and the father said, I love you, and I wish you enough. The daughter replied, Dad, our life together has been more than enough. Your love is all I ever needed. But, Dad, I wish you enough Two. They hugged and kissed, and the daughter left. The father walked over to the window where I was seated. Standing there, I could see he wanted and needed to cry. I tried not to intrude on his privacy, but he welcomed me in by asking, Did you ever say goodbye to someone knowing it would be forever? Yes, I have, I replied. Forgive me for asking, but why is this a forever goodbye? Oh, I'm old, and she lives so far away. I have challenges ahead, and the, the reality is her next trip back will be to my funeral. When you were saying goodbye, I asked, I heard you say, I wish you enough. May I ask you what that means? He smiled. That's a wish that has been handed down for generations in my family. My parents used to say it to everyone. He paused a moment and looked up as if trying to remember it in detail, and then he smiled even more. When we said enough, when we said, I wish you enough, we were wanting the other person to have a life filled with just enough good things to sustain them. Then turning toward me, he shared the following as if he were writing it, speaking it from memory. I wish you enough, son, to keep your attitude bright no matter how gray the day may appear. I wish you enough rain to appreciate the sun even more. I wish you enough happiness to keep your spirit alive and strong. I wish you enough pain so that even the smallest joys of life may appear bigger. I wish you enough gain to satisf satisfy all your needs. I wish you enough loss to appreciate all you possess. I wish you enough hellos to get you through the final goodbye. And then he began to cry and walked away. 
There was no name attached. I went back and looked, just wondering if down there in the fine print at the bottom, it might say, written by Agur. It didn't, but it might as well have. And it left me, it left me with just one thing to say to you. I wish you enough.